Hello, I'm Dave Hart. I'm the preacher for the Winslow, Arizona Church of Christ. And I'm so glad that you have chosen, chosen to join me today. Today we're going to take a look at a sermon entitled, It's Going to Take a Lot of Work. It's Going to Take a Lot of Work. And today's sermon is part two of a sermon that I did a couple of weeks ago. If you're interested in it, you can look it up on the um, YouTube page here. And it was about the building, building the church sermon. So that was a couple of weeks ago, and this is kind of like part two of it. You know, there was a time in America when the Church of Christ was the fastest growing church in America. Our people were excited about, about the work. New Christians and new churches were happening every week and all over the place. We were doing great evangelistic efforts everywhere. We had gospel meetings going on where, where it was almost expected that there would be new Christians that would come out of these gospel meetings. We, we were inviting the, the, um, those outside the church to come and to visit, and, and almost all of them ended in baptisms. We had the Jules Miller film strips that we were going door to door and showing, and, and um, those were a program where you had these film strips that you'd show through a film machine, you put a screen up, and you'd have a record that you'd put on, and it would, it would, would have a picture and tell you some things, and then there'd be a ding, and you go to the next slide, and, 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 and we, we, we were able to bring many, many people to the Lord using those Jewel Miller film strips. Door knocking, we were very active in going door knocking. And um, I, I realize as we go through these that some of these are not as effective as they used to be, but they still work. These things still work, maybe not as well as they once did, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But I know that I don't necessarily do a lot of door knocking, but what I've done in the past is I put together little packets of information about the church, and I go around and put them on, on door handles. and. I'll cover the whole town here in, in Winslow. It's a town of 10,000. I'll try to cover every door in Winslow. And almost every time that I've done that, eventually we brought somebody to the church. Yes, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. But, you know, bringing one soul is bringing one soul to the Lord. We used to have cottage meetings. Cottage meetings were very popular. And basically what that is is you invite some people to your home. And you have a Bible study with them. And we brought many, many people into the church doing that. The Joy Bus program. There again, that's something that we still do here. And we've had to shut it down because of COVID. But, but we're, it looks like we're planning to start it again here real soon. And, and it's a lot of work and a lot of effort. But there was an awful lot of Christians that were brought to the Lord through the Joy Bus program. Some of them like a man here who, who used to be brought into the church with, with a bus years ago when he was just a child. He came back. He came back when he was in his 40s. So we did the joy bus programs, handing out tracts, handing out tracts. They're, again, probably not as effective as it used to be, but don't tell me that, that there are not some people that, that are going to not read those tracts. So used to hand out a lot of tracts and so much more, so much more that we were very active of doing. In fact, there was a group of Christians in the South who got together and decided they would move to the East Coast because at that time, and it's still pretty much like that, on the East Coast there's not very many churches of Christ. So they got together and they all moved as a big group out there to different places and started churches. What a wonderful thing. Just think about that. They've left their jobs, their families, their friends to go out there and to do this great evangelistic work. And many of those churches are still open today doing the Lord's work. These people were excited. They gave it the time, energy, effort, resources, money, and they saw great gains. They saw great gains. And even though some of those things that we talked about 
may not work as well as they once did. And I believe they would all work. I believe they all do work. I've, I've seen um, most of them work, except for the Jules Miller film strips. I've never used them. I know they're still out there and you can still get them, I believe, on CD now um, through 21st Century Christian. And I believe they would still work. But the other things uh, that we talked about, the meetings, listen, there's no doubt we don't have as many people coming to the Lord through meetings as we used to do, as we used to have. But it still happens. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. And meetings, I think, have, have evolved into not being so much as bringing people into the Lord, even though that still happens and that's still something that we hope will happen with them. But it has more involved, evolved into something that's beneficial for the members themselves to encourage them, strengthen them. Um, so even though these things don't work as well as they used to, we can blame that uh, if we want to on, on several things, especially the culture. The culture has changed. You know, you go door knocking now and it's a lot harder than it used to be. They kind of assume that you're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or something. And, and, um, and it's hard to get into people's homes, you know, to set up a Jules Miller type film strip or, or on CD as they have it now. It's hard to get into people's homes. And some of these things that, that did work very well at one time do not work as well as they used to. But they're still, I think, beneficial, and I still think that most of them, at least, are things that we should try and at least do at least some when it comes to our evangelistic effort, at least put, put some time and energy and effort into some of those older methods. We had somebody come here and do a door knocking campaign for us, and I think that they knocked on around 500 doors, and we did get a member out of that. And there again, it, you know, it's a lot of work. I understand that, a lot of time, energy, and effort. And it may not be something that you want to do as your main um, evangelistic program to reach out, but it is something that does still work if you're willing to put the time and energy and effort into it. So, if those things don't work as well as they used to, what are some things that we can do nowadays that are proven to work? Well, we know that internet ministry works, and it um, works a little bit different than some of these things did before. A lot of these things before were about local evangelism, and internet ministry does help locally, but it is more of a thing to reach out to the world of Christianity, to work, reach out to the world of Christianity. So a lot of people, a lot of people just like you guys are today watching, watching this sermon, a lot of people are on the internet looking for information, looking for Christian training, all that kind of stuff. So that's a good thing to do. Friendship evangelism, this tends to be one of the best efforts that we have today to um, reach out to people, it's just to, to invite friends, people you work with, people you go to school with, neighbors, whatever, befriend them, and then invite them to church, invite them to a small group Bible study, which is another great work that is going on today, is to have some type of a small group Bible study and invite people to it. So there, there are things that we are trying to do to, to reach people in this world today. But the one thing that I think that we're kind of lacking that we used to have when it comes to making these things a success is are we as excited as we should be? Are we working as hard as, as we should be? Are we given as much time as they used to give? And I don't think in general we are. I don't think in general we are. I think the, 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 the lives in the world has become more busy and, and, and our interests are so divided. A lot of those earlier, early, earlier Christians here when, when the church was growing so fast, this is back in the 60s, a lot of their focus, and I'm not just talking about the ministers or the elders, but, but the general people of the church, a lot of their focus was on growing the church, strengthening the church, building up the church. 
and I don't think the, the, the general the general church member quite has that focus as they once did. Quite did I don't think they quite have, are as willing to work as those Christians back in the 60s were doing when the church was growing so fast. So we have to be willing to put in the work and the time as many of them did. We have to face facts. Christianity is falling on hard times in America. Oh, not so everywhere. The church is growing in Africa and South America and parts of Asia and different places like that. The church is growing quite, quite well. But in America, it is shrinking. Most every group, most every group that calls themselves Christians are losing members. The few who do seem to be growing are mostly growing because they have an active breeding component to their religion that's part of their religion to have large families. And it's not that they're bringing in so many people from outside the church, it's just that they are having large families which are causing the church to grow. The only good news about all this, if you want to call it good news, is the Church of Christ is, is shrinking slower than most other religious groups out there, even though we are, are shrinking, losing both members, numbers of members, and numbers of church, we are doing so slower than pretty much every group that's out there. You know, I was thinking when, when COVID hit and all the sickness and death and, and all the other scary things going on in the world today, that it would drive people to the Lord, that they would start thinking about their souls. But the sad thing is that they seem to be caring even less. They seem to be caring even less. And it's made it even harder to reach out. The answer to building the church, though, is never to despair, never quit, never give up and never get depressed, as hard as that can be at times. And I know it's hard. You put in all kinds of energy and effort and do all kinds of things and work and, 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 and you know, spend money on various things to try to grow the church, and then the church doesn't grow or maybe it even shrinks. And it's hard. It's hard to keep that excitement. With the things going on in the world and all the worries and concerns of gas prices and food shortages coming and, and all kinds of things like that, it can be hard to keep our focus on the Lord and His church. But the answer is to work even harder for the Lord. Become more committed to the work to always be pushing forward, no matter what, no matter what kind of setbacks. Remember, we have a powerful enemy in the devil, and he's going to throw everything at us, and he's going to try to get us discouraged and off course and, and all kinds of things. And, and it's not hard, is it? It's not hard to get off course. You just look out there, and, and you can look at some of the things even happening in the Lord's church and the apostasy that's going on and, and the things that people are trying to do to change the Lord's church to be the man, a man's church and not the Lord's church anymore. And, and it can get discouraging, but we can't let that overwhelm us. We've got to keep pushing forward. We've got to keep pushing forward. Look at the environment of the early church and what they had to deal with. They were dealing with the Jews who were coming after them. They were dealing with pagans who were coming after them. They were doing, dealing with the government that stood against them. They had all these things plus more against them, but yet, but yet, in the lifetime of the apostles, they had taken the gospel to the whole known world in one generation. And if they did that, then surely we can take the gospel to our own hometowns and even beyond in our lifetime. But it is going to take dedication, time, effort, money, and lots and lots and lots of work. So today, let's look at 
what the Bible has to say about the work that we're supposed to be doing and some of the aspects of that work. And let's start out today by looking at Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So the first thing we see here says, whatever you do, do it heartily. Do, do it with all your strength. And of course, we can apply this to secular work also, can't we? We're supposed to be hard workers. Christians should always be known for their hard work and giving their best. But also we need to do it for the Lord. Are you, are you personally doing all that you can? Are you working hard for the Lord? Are you spending that time? Are you giving to the Lord's work? Are you putting effort and energy? Are you making it a priority in your life? You know, we've all got priorities, don't we? You know, there's entertainment, there's, there's secular work, there's, there's our um, relationship with our family and friends, there's re relaxation, all those things. You know, it, it, a Christian needs to lead a balanced life, and they all have an importance. But, but where do you put the work of the Lord? on that list. Is it at the bottom, the middle, or is it at the top? We only have so much time every day. We only have so much time in our life. And, and a lot of that time is spent, is spent sleeping, isn't it? So we need to work hard for the Lord and make it a priority in our life. Remember, we're working for God. We're working for God. You know, we, we go out and we work for ourselves, we work for our families, we work for, uh, to have vacations and to buy houses and, and all that kind of stuff. And there again, uh, nothing wrong with those things. If, in fact, those things uh, are necessary, some of those things are necessary. But we need to understand the work for the Lord is the most important. It is the work in the end that's going to pay the most benefits. Oh, you go to work here and you get money and you buy a house and the house falls apart. You buy a brand new car. It's exciting to get a new car, isn't it? Love that new car smell and it's just so nice to have that car in 10 years. Uh, you know, the, the car's falling apart and you want a new one. But when we do work for, the, for God, it, it gives us a great reward here in this life but even a greater reward in the next life. So we need to be excited, we need to be working hard, and we need to understand that we will be rewarded with a reward that won't rust, that won't rot, but will last for all eternity when we go to meet the Lord one day. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it's telling us to be steadfast, to, 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 to stand strong, to keep doing it, to keep doing it. You know, sometimes we can think, well, I'm going to go help the Lord, I'm going to go help the church do this, whatever program it is. Maybe it's VBS. Now, go help for the week and do VBS, and that's a great work, I believe. And, and you go and you work really hard and you do all that, and, and, um, and then you kind of say, okay, I did my work for the year, I'm done. And after VBS, you could really feel like that, can't you? But the Bible says to be steadfast, that means doing it all the time. Doing it all the time, wonderful. You put in that hard work for VBS, take a couple of days off and get back at some other program the church has going or project or individual evangelism or, or whatever it is. Immovable, it says we're to be immovable. This means that we're to stand on the work that we do for the Lord. We need to be sure it, it, it's a biblical work that we're doing, that it's after the pattern that is shown in the scriptures. But then we need to be immovable. We need to do it. If it's a good work, we need to do it. We need to keep doing it. And we don't want to move from that. We don't want to move from that. So it's always abounding in the work. There again, always doing it. Always abounding. Always giving your best. 
abounding, you know, abounding, lots of it, much of it. Keep abounding in the Lord. Keep doing the, the, the work that you're doing. And know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There again, this can be a hard one because, we, you know, you can do a lot of work for the Lord and you don't see the effort. You don't see the effort. But the Bible says that the word of God um, will not return void. In other words, it will accomplish what it's going to do. It won't be in vain. It won't be void. It will accomplish. Does that mean it's always going to be a success as far as we would see a success? Look, when I preach a sermon, I, I want people to listen. I want to hear. I want them to hear the word of God through what I'm preaching. And I want them to respond by changing their lives or getting closer to God or becoming baptized. And that doesn't always happen. It's what I want to happen. That's what I hope to happen. I believe that's what God would want to happen. But even if it doesn't, I'm still preaching the word of God. How many times in the Old Testament did God send a prophet to a nation knowing they weren't going to listen to him? God, who, who I believe knows everything in the future, had Noah preached to his generation. The whole time, it had to be a long time, they were building that ark. But yet, other than his family, nobody came to the Lord. Nobody was saved. But Noah saved himself and his family, and so doing, saving us, didn't he? So sometimes we get really down. We have a meeting, and we hope to bring in uh, the, you know, all our neighbors, and it doesn't happen. We do a VBS, and not many kids show up. Whatever it is, it can it can be hard, and it can make us think, well, man, we put all that energy, time, effort, and money into that, and and, and I don't want to do that anymore. It's just just too much for so little. But that's not how God sees it. God is pleased with his people when they do his work. And it will not be vain. It will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. It will accomplish what God, maybe not what we're hoping it accomplishes, but it will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. So we have to always be abounding, keep going, and know that the work that we do, if it's for the Lord in the right way, for the right purpose and the right reasons, will never be in vain. And we, we may not save a whole bunch of souls, but we're going to save our own soul if we do that, aren't we? Are we not? So, so we need to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Proverbs 14, verse 23. Proverbs 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Listen, it's easy to make plans. In fact, our church here, Lord willing, Sunday, we're going to have a meeting with the whole church, talk about future plans, and then have a men's meeting to, to look over those plans to see what we want to go forward with. And we're going to be looking at a lot of things and, and, and lay out what we want to do. But, but we can't just talk about, we can't just lay these plans out. We got to execute these plans. We got to work at them. We got to work at them. And I hope everything that we look at, everything that we decide is going to be a great success for the Lord. And, and there again, remember, if we're doing what the Lord wants, it's not in vain and will be a success. But. You know, of course, we're hoping it's going to be a success as far as building the church up, bringing more members in, drawing us closer to God, having more knowledge of the Lord. Those are the things that we're hoping for that they, that they will do. But we have to work at them. We have to work at them. And the harder we work at them, the more a chance of a great success we have with them. So it's more than just talking, you know, there's a lot of times they'll have evangelism seminars and things and a lot of people go. I've got, you know, when, when I go to lectureships, uh, I, I'm usually always drawn to the ones that are talking about evangelism and, and bringing people in. And I usually go to those or if I, if I can or if I go to something else, I usually buy the CD or whatever they have. And, and, and I'm very interested in that. But they don't do any good unless you implement them. 
unless you implement the ideas and work at them. So it's easy, it's easy to come up with ideas, but it's hard to follow through. It's hard to follow through. A lot of times you'll have the idea people and you'll have the worker people. There's people that have great ideas and they'll present wonderful ideas, but then they don't have the skills. God has given them the skills to really fall through because there's always a lot of details. There's always a lot of details. Somebody can say, hey, let's have a VBS. And somebody else can say, yeah, let's have a VBS. VBSs are good and, and all that. But then you've got to plan it out, and you've got to get the program, and you've got to get teachers, and you've got to get those cookies, because it just ain't a VBS about those cookies, and, and you've got to do all those things. So it starts with the plan, but then we've got to work the plan. We've got to, we've got to work and work hard for those plans to become a success. Luke 1, verse 37. Luke 1, verse 37. For if God nothing will be impossible, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. I believe we need to plan and plan big. And, and, and I'm talking about here when it comes to the church as a whole, but also as the individual Christians. Because I believe that every Christian should be involved in the work of the church as a whole, but also you should have your own plan, whatever it might be. Maybe it's an internet ministry. Those of you who know my internet ministry, I work very hard at that. And, and it takes a lot of time, energy, and effort. Um, you know, maybe you're going to have a door knocking um, plan. Maybe you're going to take the whole family out every Saturday and go door knocking or whatever it is. Have some individual plans and plan big, but also the church, plan big, plan big. Reach for the stars. Listen, you may not make the stars, but maybe you can make the moon. Maybe you can make the moon. I remember reading the book, Education of a Bodybuilder by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he talked about you know lifting weights and how when he would lift weights, he would imagine, like if he's working his bicep, he would imagine his bicep was filling the whole room. That it was just, it, it was growing so big that it was impossible for a bicep to grow that big. But he said by doing that, his bicep would never grow that big, but it would grow bigger. But he said if he would limit his thinking on that, if he had limit his thinking of growth, that it would never reach even the size that he was thinking that it might. So we need to be that way. We need to realize that nothing is impossible with God. And maybe you have a, have a small church. And listen, I've been doing this work a long time now. And one of the things that I've noticed with every church that I've worked at, we grow and we shrink. We grow and we shrink. There's a time of growth. I love that time. It's wonderful. And then there's a time of you will have several deaths and maybe some people will move away. Some will become shut in. Some will leave the church for whatever reason. And, and, and you shrink back down again. And that's why you got to keep on going, keep on going. And you don't know, maybe you have that small church right now. And whatever size you have, you need to be bigger, don't you? We need to be pushing forward. Realize nothing is impossible with God. But... We have to do our work. We have to do our job. God counts on us to be his hands and feet. He's the head, but he counts on us to be his hands and feet. And we need to go out and do the work. So there again, we have to be diligent to prove ourselves, um, to present ourselves approved to God. We have to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. Don't get tired. Listen, I know sometimes People get tired, churches get tired. Uh, we, we got a lot of churches with, that, that have a lot of old people. And I, I, I got a, a message the other day, he's talking about traveling, he's 58 and he says it's discouraging that he's the youngest one in most of the churches that he goes to visit as he's traveling. 
That can be discouraging. Churches can get older. But even those that are older and are shrinking, they can renew. They can turn things around. But it's going to take a lot of work, energy, and effort in getting out of your comfort zone. We get in these comfort zones. We get in a rut. I think we all do it. I know I do. We get to that point where we're comfortable with our Christianity. Well, you know, I'm going on Sundays, I'm going on Sunday nights, and I'm going on Wednesdays, and, and I give, you know, whatever percent to the Lord, and, 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 and we get comfortable with that. God doesn't want us comfortable. He wants us abounding in His work and always doing more and more and more. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You notice these, these words like diligent and always abounding and things. See, God wants us to be at it all the time, to not give up, to not quit. Oh, your work may change as you grow as a Christian. Maybe you're going to um, you know, start teaching a formal Bible study class, and, and maybe you're going to grow beyond there and start doing some substitute preaching, and maybe you'll grow there from there and, and become a preacher. You know, who knows? But we need to be growing. We need to be growing in our work. I remember a family years and years ago that they were new Christians. They wanted some kind of work to do with the church. And, and um, the first thing that, that I had them do was, was on the backs of the seats where you have the um, visitor cards and the songbooks and pencils. I said, well, why don't you guys be sure that all that's straightened up and there's no garbage in there and, and the pencils are sharp and there's visitor cards. And that's what they started out doing, but that's not where they finished at. They gone on to do, the whole family gone on to do all kinds of things, preaching and teaching and, and, and working there again in vacation Bible schools and special programs and, and helping in all kinds of ways and stuff. So we need to be diligent and, 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 and and there again, our work may change as we grow. Our work may change as uh, things change in our lives, as we get older. As we get older, I knew a lady that worked with the little, the little kids teaching Bible class for many, many, many years. And finally, her arthritis and things made it just too hard for her to get down and work with those kids. And she had to give that up. But, but she did other work. She did other work at that time. She, she took care of the books for the church. So sometimes our, our work will change that way. But the point is to be diligent in order to be approved to God it means we've got to be doing it all the time. A worker does, does not need to be ashamed. We can be ashamed of the work we do for God we, by, by not doing it, doing it lazily, do, doing it wrong, or doing it unscripturally. So we need to be a worker who's not ashamed of the work that we're doing. Rightly dividing the word of truth, what does that mean? That means we need to understand the word of God. We need to understand the divisions. Old Testament from New Testament, understand the difference between the old and the new. We need to understand false teaching from right teaching. We, we need to understand the commands, the examples, the necessary inference in the Bible. So many things. We need to divide the word of truth. We need to understand the word of God. And we need to do that, of course, for our own souls. But we also need to do that so that we will be able to teach others correctly. Others correctly. Listen, none of us have perfect Bible knowledge. No matter who it is, none of us have absolute perfect Bible knowledge. But I have seen Christians in the church who are teachers who made just terrible mistakes things they should have known better. So we need to be studying. We need to be people who diligently study the Word of God to be able to diligently teach the Word of God to others. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So, why are we created? We were created, one of the reasons we're created is we're created in Christ Jesus and become a Christian. We're, we're created to, to do good works, to do good works. What are good works? Good works are the things that God says is good. 
helping people, benevolence work. There's a lot of people in need. I'm afraid there's going to be a lot more in need um, in the next few years. I hope I'm wrong, but, but there's a lot of people in need. We need to look around and we need to be prepared. If you do have a church with a lot of older people, a lot of times they'll have some needs. So we need to do the benevolence works. We, we need to edify people, people who are Christians. We need to build them up. We need to teach them. We need to strengthen them. And we need to fellowship with them. It's good works. And we need to evangelize. We need to bring the lost to the Lord. We need to bring the lost to the Lord. And that should always be a priority, an ongoing priority with all of us. Of all of us. And God has created us for those good works. Not only that, but he prepared them ahead of time. He had he has stuff for us to do that he has prepared. We need to keep our eyes and ears open for those things. We need to be looking for those things. See, so many Christians are like, well, if a need falls in my lap, then maybe I'll take care of it. No, we need to be Christians who are actively looking for needs to be done. We, we used to have an older lady here. She lived to be 100. Pauline was her name. She was a wonderful lady. Oh, she, I miss her so much. And, 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 and she was always looking for needs in the church. And she was proactive. She would come up to me and say, Hey, Dave, that thing over there needs to be fixed. Here's some money. Don't tell anybody. Um, go get it fixed. Or, or somebody would have a baby and she'd say, well, we need to have a baby shower for that person. Or whatever it was, she was always proactive, always looking for good works that she could do. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be proactive because believe me, there's always works that need to be done. If you don't think that there are, go ask your preacher, go ask your elders. They'll probably give you more work than you could ever imagine or ever handle. Galatians 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, verse 9. Now let us not grow weary or doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So there again, we're not to grow weary. Over and over again, we see this. Keep doing it. Keep going. Don't grow weary. Well, but, but, but I'm tired, but I want to, you know, this or that, or I'm not seeing there again the success that I want to see. God says, don't grow weary. We must not quit. We must not give up. No matter how dark it gets, no matter, no matter how few you might be right now, don't give up. Listen, we might have to change some things, make some adjustments, do things differently, change the focus of our work. Now, none of those things am I saying going outside of the bounds of the church going outside the bounds of scripture, going outside the bounds of the pattern. But I am saying maybe you're trying to do children's ministry where the, um, the community has aged and is mostly older people. You may have to switch to working for, old, working for older people, going after older people. Or it could be the other way around. Maybe you've, you've been, has, been, has been successful in the past of going after older people, but, but now, um, there's a lot of kids in the community and, and, and they may be where your focus should be at. Like here, when we focused on the children, which once again we hope to get back to real soon now, Lord willing, COVID will, will, will keep getting better. Everybody pray for that, please. Um, we, we, we were very successful in bringing especially the Native American children into the church for them to hear and learn the word of God and we have many baptisms and many great successes even though it was, a, it was a incredibly hard and difficult work but that those were people that would come in that would listen but you say they're only children so what so what did God tell us we weren't to preach to children and teach children? No, we see that the, Jesus said, let the children come to me. 
how wonderful it is to teach a child and have him become a Christian and, and, and remain faithful all of his life. Or, or we may be the only chance a child will ever hear the gospel. And maybe they'll hear it from us and they'll, and they'll leave for many, many, many years. Like the man I was talking about earlier who came in the bus program. Leave the church for many, many, many years, but then finally come back, finally come back. We have to keep working and we are to be smart about it. We're to look at our programs, look at the things that we're doing. Are they being efficient and effective or do we need to make some changes in our focus and the way that we're doing things? The Bible says, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. We will reap. So we can't lose heart. If we lose heart, we're not going to reap. If we get discouraged, if we give up, if we quit trying, we're not going to reap. So we have to not lose heart knowing that God gives us a promise that if we keep going, we are going to reap success, whether it's success as we might see it or success as the Lord sees it. Either way, there will be a success. Romans 12, 11 through 12. Romans 12, 11 through 12. Not lagging in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually continuing steadfastly in prayers. So not lagging in diligence. Once again, we, we, we're to keep going. We're to be excited. We're to be motivated. We're to charge ahead. We're just to keep going. It's kind of like, kind of like that when you played football and you got the ball and you ran. And maybe you didn't even make it over the line or you barely made it over the line and they hit you and they knocked you down and it hurt and you got back up and you went back and you were just as determined as ever when you got that ball the next time to get a little farther down the line. We need to be diligent. We need to be getting the ball down the line. We need to be pushing it down the line, fervent in spirit. Be excited for the Lord and his work and continue that excitement. Listen, sometimes it's hard. I've had, I've had um, uh, you know, Bible studies with a lot of people in the room. And I've had Bible studies with just a few. And it is hard to have just as much excitement when I have few as I do when I have many. But I try to do that because, because the Lord says to always be fervent in, in spirit, whether you're teaching one or you're teaching thousands. And we know Jesus did that, didn't we? He, he, he taught thousands. But we see the very same excitement in his teaching when he met the woman at the well or Nicodemus. We need to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. We need to be servants of the Lord. What do servants do? They obey their masters. They do what their master asks them to do if they're going to be a good servant. And that's what we need to do. Rejoicing in hope. We need to have hope. Of course, we always have the hope of heaven. But we need to have the hope of building the body of Christ, doing God's work, and being a success in doing so. Patient in tribulation. Listen, as you work at building the church, you're going to have hard times. It's going to be tribulations. There's going to be all kinds of problems. Listen, if your church is going well right now, praise God for it. Be thankful for it. But I'm going to tell you a truth. Sooner or later, something's going to hit your church where you're at. It's going to come in from the blind side. You know, the blind side of football where they come around, you can't see them. And all of a sudden, boom! That, that, you know, when, when you're playing football and you see them coming and you duck down and you know you, you're going to hit them and they're going to hit you, you can prepare for that shock and you know what's going to happen. But when you get hit by the blind side, that's, that's a terrible, scary, jarring feeling. And that's what happens in churches. You get hit by the blind side. Satan doesn't fight fair. And there's nothing beneath Satan that he won't do. And he will blindside you. And the Lord says to be patient. Churches go through difficult times. It's called the body of Christ. And bodies get hurt. Bodies get sick. Bodies get damaged. And bodies take time to heal. So be patient during those times and work towards that healing. Work towards the body getting strong and better again. And continually steadfastly in prayers. We need to pray. We need to be praying for the growth of the church, the work for the church. As I said earlier, we're going to be having this meeting Sunday. And I'm asking you, 
if you would pray for the work here in Winslow, Arizona, that God would give us the wisdom and the skill and the knowledge and the patience and the understanding and the financial resources to do the work the best way we can possibly do it for the Lord and to do it the way that He would want us to do it. And you should be praying for each of your individual churches and continue in that prayer that they would do the same, that they would be workers. Got to pray for the workers, pray for the harvesters. We need to pray for the workers, pray for the work, pray for the lost. Pray for your church and every church of the Lord that it would be an absolute success, that the work that they do would be successful and that they would have a desire, that they would have a desire to do that work and to make plans for it. I want to thank you for watching today. If you are using this video as your Sunday sermon, please don't forget the other, other acts of worship. Um, this can be your sermon teaching time. But don't forget your prayers to the Lord, the Lord's Supper, to give of your means to the Lord, and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to the Lord. If you are not a Christian today, if you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins, please go visit the Church of Christ or call them, get acquainted with them, go see them, and tell them that you want to be saved, and you want to know that you're saved, and you want to know that you're saved the right way, the way the Bible says to be saved. And if you found this video useful today, I'd ask that you please share it with others. I hope that you have a blessed week. Once again, thank you for watching, and God bless each and every one of you.